Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the class. Uh, in this video, we will go over chapter 27, uh, the reproductive system. Now the whole point of the reproductive system is to produce and to nurture sex cells and then transport them to sites of fertilization. And there are, of course, different uh, sex cells depending on uh, they're being produced by the male or female. Uh, the male sex cells are a sperm and the female sex cells are eggs. And eggs are also known as oocytes. So whenever you see this prefix of OO, that's always a reference to egg in general. Now each sex cell, regardless if it's a sperm or an egg, will have one set of genetic uh, chromosomes, one set of uh, genetic instructions. And they're carried on 23 chromosomes. And they're going to be produced by a special type of cell division called uh, meiosis. Now, meiosis only happens in sex cells. Okay, we'll start with the male reproductive system first. Now, the primary sex organ uh, for the male reproductive system are the testes. Another term that you may see used for uh, primary sex organ is the term gonad. Now, gonad is a generic term that means the primary sex organ in general. So, for males, the gonad are the testes. And for females, the gonads are the ovaries. So it's not specific uh, for one sex or the other. It's a term that applies to both. Now everything else in the reproductive system, uh, doesn't matter if it's internal or if it's external, uh, doesn't matter what it is or what it does, if it's not the gonad, it's considered to be an accessory. Okay, here we have a illustration of the reproductive system uh, for the male. See, we have uh, the testis here. Of course, the penis here, uh, urinary bladder is right here. This is the part of the large intestine that's been uh, cut open, uh, so you can see internally. But we will talk about many of these structures on this image. Uh, not all of them, but we will mention uh, several of these uh, throughout this chapter. I right, will first start off uh, with the testes. And the term testes is a plural term. Uh, the singular form of that would be testis. So when you're talking about both, you're talking about testes. And these are uh, suspended uh, by a structure called the spermatic cord. And they will be housed within a, a pouch-like uh, structure called the scrotum. Now as uh, the male develops, the testes actually start off in the abdominal cavity and then will descend their way outside of the body. And the space that they are uh, descending through as they exit the body is called the inguinal canal or the inguinal canal. And after the testes uh, fully descend, the spermatic cord will contain various nerves, uh, blood vessels, and also the vas deferens. All right, here we have a male uh, fetus and a newborn male infant. And you can see the differences in the development. So we'll focus on here where the cursor is. That's the testis at about three months in, the, in development. You move on a little bit later, in seven months, the testis has this descended down through this space here, the inguinal canal. And then in a newborn male, you're going to have uh, the testis fully external uh, of the body. Each of the testes are divided into uh, several uh, small compartments. Each of these compartments is called a lobule. And there are about uh, 250 lobules within each testis. Inside each of these lobules, is a very highly coiled structure called the seminiferous tubules. Now, each of these tubules is going to be lined with a very specialized form of epithelial tissue uh, containing uh, spermatogenic cells. And it's these cells that will give rise to the sperm cells. Now the cells that lie in between the seminiferous tubules are called uh, specialized interstitial cells, but the formal name of these cells are the cells of Leydig. And it's these cells that will produce uh, the male sex hormones like the testosterone. All right here we have a a cross section of one testis here. And you see the various individual compartments here where the cursor is. And inside each one you'll see a seminiferous tubule. Then we'll zoom in on this one area here. That's what this is. So if you zoom in just on that one area you'll see a section like this. All right in this image these blue dots that are found throughout here those are the beginnings of the sperm cells. They're called uh, spermatogonia. And what happens here, the cells will start off here on the very outer edge. 
of these tubules. As they are developing, as they mature, they get moved inward toward the inner lumen of this structure here. That's why these sperm cells here have the tails, because they are more developed and more mature than the sperm cells uh, from here at this uh, initial uh, line of development. Now that last image, of course, was an illustration. This is a real image of uh, a cross-section of seminiferous tubules. You can see the uh, beginning sperm cells are going to be out here on the outer edges. And as the sperm develop and mature, they get pushed toward the middle. And it's kind of faint on this image, but you, you can see uh, the tails that are put on the sperm cells right here. So that's uh, one view. And then a little bit a closer view is something like this. This is exactly what was on the last slide, but with much greater detail. So you have the uh, spermatogenic cells on the outermost uh, part here. Then as the sperm cells get more mature, more developed, they get pushed toward the middle lumen. And here you can clearly see uh, the tails of uh, the sperm cells uh, here as opposed to out here because they are not developed yet at that point. All right, next we'll talk about some more details on sperm cells. And the process of a sperm cell maturing is called uh, spermiogenesis. And anytime you see the word uh, or the ending genesis, that means uh, the creation of or the beginning of. So spermiogenesis is the creation of sperm cells. And each sperm cell will have uh, different uh, components to it. You have the head, which is where you have the nucleus and the 23 chromosomes. The head of the sperm cell is covered with a structure called the acrosome. And this structure looks like a hat that goes on top of the, the head of the sperm cell. And within this structure, you have uh, digestive enzymes that will help that sperm cell uh, to penetrate the egg so it can fertilize it. The next piece you have is called the midpiece. This is where you find a very high number of mitochondria. And then the, the longest part of the sperm cell uh, the most recognizable part of the sperm cell or is the tail. And this is where you have microtubule. All right, so here we have a illustration of a typical uh, sperm cell. All right, you have the head here. Then resting on top of that would be the acrosome. Then you have the midpiece here where you find all the uh, mitochondria uh, needed to help propel the sperm cell forward. It, it takes energy uh, to move this tail so it can be propelled forward. So all the mitochondria needed for that action would be found here. So this is an illustration. These are real images of sperm cells. And you can see more clearly on some uh, compared to others the distinction between uh, where the acrosome is and how it rests on the head of the whole sperm cell. All right, next we'll talk about some of the uh, internal uh, accessory organs of the male reproductive system. Uh, the first one is the epididymis. These are very, very tightly coiled tubes that are found on each of the testes. And when I say highly coiled, I mean each one is about 6 meters long. That's about 19 feet. So that's found on both the testes. And it's in this structure, the epididymis, is where sperm cells go to mature. And that process is vitally important because immature sperm cells are not modal. That means they cannot move on their own. So here we have a uh, cross section of uh, the epididymis here and you can clearly see the sperm cells and their tails uh, here toward the lumen. Right, another internal uh, accessory uh, structure is the vas deferens. Uh, this structure is also known as the ductus deferens and these will lead from uh, each testis. Uh, they're about 45 centimeters long. They're fairly long muscular tubes and each one will extend from the epididymis to a structure called the ejaculatory duct. And this is the structure that gets uh, cut during a vasectomy. And that's why it has that name. Suffix ectomy means the removal of. So it's the removal of the vas deferens, or a section of the vas deferens. So here's how that works. On this uh, square, you have the before picture, and here you have after. So testis here epididymis here, vas deferens leading from there, and then goes up and over the bladder and circles back around to the ejaculatory duct. So if you zoom in on this square here, you have this. 
So that's what a vasectomy is. You are preventing sperm cells from getting from the epididymis uh, to be ejaculated out. And there are really two ways you can do this. There's a more permanent way and then there's a temporary way. In the temporary way, what you're doing is taking this part of the vas deferens, cutting it, and then basically putting what is essentially uh, twist ties on either end, which is what you would see here. And in the more permanent method, what you have is this section of the vas deferens being cut and then the ends here being cauterized or basically being burnt away. In either case, the whole point is preventing sperm cells from traveling from the epididymis down through the vas deferens and then going all the way out. Because in this situation, the sperm cells will get to here and then they're stopped. There's no passageway between this part of the vas deferens and this part. Now what many people don't realize is if this a procedure is not done properly if the ends are not uh, properly cauterized or if the ends here are not uh, tied off correctly these two ends of the vas deferens can grow back together so it is possible it's not common but it is possible for a man to get a vasectomy but still be able to get a woman pregnant if the procedure was not done properly and one more thing i'll mention with this uh, procedure here if a male does get this procedure, there is no effect on the ejaculate that he has. Everything is still present. The only thing that's not added to what he ejaculates out are the sperm cells, which is what, of course, you would need to fertilize an egg and to get a woman pregnant. All right, another structure we'll talk about are these seminal vesicles. And each of these are going to be attached to the vas deferens uh, near the base of the urinary bladder. And what their role here is, they secrete a fructose, which is a kind of sugar. And it's there to give the sperm cells energy. In addition to making fructose, these uh, vesicles will also secrete a substance called prostaglandins. And those are there to help uh, stimulate the uh, female reproductive organs uh, contract and to hold in uh, the ejaculate from the male. And all these contents are released into the ejaculatory duct. Another internal structure we'll talk about is the prostate gland. This is a, a gland that will secrete a very thin, very watery, very alkaline fluid. And its role is to enhance uh, sperm mobility. So it helps them swim a little bit better. It also has another role because of the uh, alkaline nature of the secretion. It's there to protect the sperm cells because the environment of the uh, vagina uh, tends to be more acidic so if the sperm cells have a protective uh, coating with an alkaline secretion more of them will survive as they enter the uh, vagina and the ducts for the prostate gland uh, will open into the urethra right, our next structure some people call it uh, cowper's glands uh, the formal name is the bulbo urethral glands these are just inferior uh, to the prostate and what these glands do is they secrete a a mucus-like uh, substance whenever the male is aroused and the whole point here is to uh, lubricate the end of the penis in the anticipation of having sex. Or right, here we have a a posterior view of the bladder up here you see the ureters joining the bladder here you have the seminal vesicles on either side right there uh, you have the prostate right there of course the penis here and then the uh, testes on either side here, one testis, uh, the epididymis, the vas deferens going up and over the bladder, and then the secretions of the seminal vesicle will meet with the uh, secretions of the prostate gland and then be ejaculated out of the penis. Now the location of the prostate gland you can see is directly underneath the bladder. This is why if a male has a irritated or a swollen prostate, that's why they tend to urinate quite often, especially if they are uh, laying down. They get the sensation that they have to pee a lot more often because of this structure starting to swell or become irritated will irritate the bladder. All right, the last internal structure we'll discuss is semen. Now, when most people hear semen, all they think of is just the sperm cells, but it's a lot more than that. Semen is everything that gets ejaculated out uh, from the male. 
So it's the sperm cells, but also the fluids from the seminal vesicles and the prostate glands, bulbo urethral glands. So it's everything that comes out is what uh, the semen is. Uh, the volume of the semen that gets ejaculated uh, will vary depending on the male. It can range anywhere from 2 to 5 milliliters. And the number of sperm cells can vary greatly uh, among men depending on their overall health and then their age. But that number could be anywhere from 40 million sperm cells to 600 million sperm cells. And even though it sounds like a lot, you know, even on the lower end, you know, 40 million is still a, a pretty high number of cells. Many of them won't make it past the opening to the vagina. Because the environment is so acidic, most of them will die off right there. So you need a very high number of sperm cells that are produced because so many are going to be lost or in the effort to fertilize an egg. All right, now we'll go on to some external uh, structures in the, in the male system. Uh, one we already mentioned before, the scrotum. This is the, uh, the pouch of skin and also uh, subcutaneous tissue that will house each uh, testis. You'll have uh, two chambers. Each one will have you know, one testis and one epididymis. And the scrotum will contain a muscle called the dartos muscle. And this is a, a smooth muscle that will contract and relax to help regulate the temperature of the testes. Now, sperm cells are best kept at a temperature that is slightly below normal body temperature. So it needs to be about one degree Celsius lower than your typical internal body temperature. That's why the testes are external to the body. They need it to be a little bit cooler. So if the male uh, gets too hot, this muscle will relax and the testes will descend to get it away from that heat source. If it gets cold, this muscle will contract and pull the testes closer to the body to get it to warm up. And the last uh, external structure we'll talk about, of course, when we talk about the male reproductive system, uh, we'll talk about the penis. Now, this has a dual role. It conveys both urine for the urinary system and also semen uh, that gets ejaculated out. It is uh, specialized to become erect due to uh, columns of spongy uh, erectile tissue. Uh, the enlarged uh, part of the penis, the head of the penis. Uh, the formal name is called the glans pe uh, penis. And this may or may not be covered by the structure called the uh, prepuce. And the prepuce is the technical name of the foreskin. And it's this structure that is removed if a male has a circumcision. All right, so looking at illustrations here, you have the, uh, the glans penis here. You see the outer edge of the prepuce here, the foreskin here. Various layers are pulled back so you can see the, the vasculature here. If you were to look at uh, the shaft of the penis in cross section, this is what you would see. And these are the three columns of erectile tissue here. Those are what allow the, the penis to become erect as blood flow uh, increases into those columns. And then here you see the opening to the urethra here. That's the structure that will convey both urine and semen outside of the body. Now on uh, this slide, there are all of the structures we've talked about, both internal and external, both what their name is and what they do as their main function. So if you are uh, someone that likes to make flashcards, this would be a very good slide to go over. There'll be another one very similar to this at the end of the uh, female reproductive system. So those will help you save time going through all the, uh, the structures and what they do. You can just reference those two slides. But this is the one for, for the male reproductive system. Okay, now we'll move on to the female reproductive system. And the female reproductive organs are specialized to produce eggs, or oocytes. And in addition to making those, they are specialized to provide a favorable environment for developing offspring and also to produce various sex hormones. I mentioned before that the, the primary sex organ, or the gonad for the male, would be the testes. Uh, the gonads for the females are the ovaries. And again, it's like we have with uh, the male. Anything that is not the ovaries within the female, whether it be internal or external, uh, doesn't matter what it is, no matter what it does, it's considered to be an accessory. So if it's not the ovaries or if it's not the testes, they are accessory structures. Right, a similar view to what we have with the male system. It's a, a female in cross-section. I'll give you some reference points here. We have the opening to the vagina right here. You have the bladder here, uh, the uterus here, 
parts of the large intestine and the rectum cut so you can see internally here. Here, this is not terribly clear on this image. This is one of the fallopian tubes, but this would be coming out. So think of a 3D version of this coming out towards you from the image. And you could tell by looking at the relationship between the uterus here and the bladder here. This is why whenever a woman gets pregnant, especially toward the later stages of the pregnancy, why you feel like you have to pee all the time. Because as this gets larger and larger, as the fetus gets larger and larger, all that pressure is going to be right here onto the bladder. And just like we have with the, uh, the male image, we will talk about a lot of the items that are listed here. Not all of them, but we will talk about a good number of them. All right, we'll start with the ovaries first. Uh, these are going to be uh, two oval-shaped uh, solid structures that lie on uh, the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity. There are a series of ligaments that are there to hold the ovary in place, but we'll talk about just a few by name. Uh, the largest one, when it spans all the way across from one ovary to the next, is called the broad ligament. Uh, the other two that we'll mention by name, uh, one ligament will hold the ovary from the upper end, and one will hold it from the bottom end. The one that holds it from the top is called the uh, suspensory ligament. So think of this as suspending the ovary from the top, like a, a ceiling fan or a chandelier, for example. The ligament that holds it from the lower end is called the ovarian ligament. So broad will span the entire length from ovary to ovary. A suspensory ligament will hold it from the top. An ovarian will hold it from the bottom. All right here we have a very generic representation of the pelvis and a way to visualize the broad ligament, which will go from here all the way across to over here. We're looking at just one ovary right here where the cursor is. And of course, the other one, the left ovary, be over here. But on this one, the ligament that holds it from the top, suspensory ligament, and the structure that holds it from the bottom here where the cursor is would be the ovarian ligament. Now, each ovary has two distinct regions. And these terms are going to be ones you've already seen before, so they should not be anything new. Those are the uh, cortex and the medulla. The cortex is the outermost part of the ovary, and then the medulla is more toward the middle, or the inner part. Uh, the medulla is what will contain nerve fibers, uh, lymphatic structures, uh, blood vessels. But the cortex is going to be a lot more uh, compact of a tissue. It will appear uh, grainy when you look at it on the slide, and it has that appearance due to the appearance of ovarian follicles. Now, after a female is born, the female's eggs will go through multiple stages of development. And each of these stages has a different name. And they're named in a way to indicate how far along they have been developed. An immature egg is called a primary oocyte. And something I mentioned before, when you see a term like primary, that doesn't indicate the level of importance. It indicates when in a sequence of events this step is happening. Primary oocyte. This is the first beginning step of everything. Now each primary oocyte will be surrounded by a layer of epithelial cells. So this combination, both the oocyte and this layer of epithelial cells, that combination together is collectively known as a primordial follicle. Now the development of the primary oocytes will basically be put on pause right before the, the female is born. And it won't do anything more until she goes through puberty. Now the second bullet point I do want to clarify. For a very long time, uh, it was thought that when the female is born, that she would have all the eggs that she would ever have in her entire life. And that a male would be able to continue to make sperm cells through most of their adult life. Well, there is some recent research that may change that. There is some research that indicates that females may be able to continue to make eggs throughout their life. So this first statement may or may not be true, depending on if current research is uh, proven correct. Uh, next thing we'll talk about is oogenesis. Like we saw with spermatogenesis, the creation of sperm cells, oogenesis is the process of egg formation. So starting at puberty, uh, some primary oocytes will continue meiosis and will continue to be uh, more developed. When a primary oocyte divides, cytoplasm is not divided up equally. So when you think of a normal cell going through division, you think of everything gets doubled, and then for the cytoplasm, half goes over here, half goes over there, everything is equal. But that's not the case at all when it comes to primary oocytes. 
you have a much larger structure that's formed. That's called the secondary oocyte. And then you have a, a fairly small structure called a polar body. So the distribution of cytoplasm is nowhere near equal here. Now it is this secondary oocyte. This is what will eventually become the egg cell or the ovum that is capable of being fertilized by a sperm cell. This is the structure that gets uh, released during ovulation each month. Now, the secondary oocyte will undergo meiosis too if it does get fertilized which will result in a second polar body and also a zygote. This is the fertilized egg. This is the beginning of, of life. So we all start off as a zygote, the combination of one sperm cell and one egg cell. That one cell will become two, those two will become four, and eight, and 16, and so on. So after fertilization occurs, what you have as an end result is one egg cell and three polar bodies. So here we have a summary of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 comparing sperm cells, which you see on the left-hand side, egg cells in the female. Now the end product of meiosis 2 is having four daughter cells being produced. So for males, you'll have four uh, genetically different sperm cells here. But for females, you're going to have one egg and then three polar bodies. Right here we have actual images of a of a secondary oocyte and a polar body being produced so you can see as they go through divisions here the very large difference in size so secondary oocyte would be here and then here where it says pb that's the polar body so it's not an equal split of cytoplasm it's probably about 75 80 percent for one structure and then the remainder uh, for the polar body at puberty the anterior pituitary gland will secrete a hormone called FSH, that's a follicle stimulating hormone, and this will cause the ovaries to get larger. During each reproductive cycle, some primordial follicles will mature into primary follicles, and those will mature into secondary follicles. And the full maturation of a follicle takes between uh, 10 to 14 days. And at this point, this is called the graphene follicle. So here we have a graphene follicle, this whole structure here. Here is the secondary oocyte here. All right, now we'll get into the process of ovulation. The process of ovulation is releasing the secondary oocyte from the follicle. Now this process is triggered by a very large increase, a very large spike of the hormone LH, luteinizing hormone, uh, from the anterior pituitary. This will cause the follicle to rapidly swell and then the walls will become fairly weak. So that increase in size and the weakening of the wall will cause that secondary oocyte to be ejected out of the follicle. And it gets ejected out toward the fallopian tube. So going back to this image here, this inner space here will get more filled up with fluid. The walls will become very, very thin and very weak. So this secondary oocyte gets uh, ejected out. All right, on this image, this is the actual process of ovulation. So here, where the arrow is and where the cursor is, that's the secondary oocyte being ejected out of the graphene follicle here. But this whole structure is the uh, graphene follicle. And then the structure that's in white would be the uh, surface of the ovary. Here's kind of a, a summary of what all these structures are going through at various points in time. You have the primordial follicle, the very beginnings of this follicle here, leads to a primary follicle, and as they develop, you see them become more and more mature. Uh, the structure in the middle is a primary oocyte. Then you see it getting much larger in size here. That increase of size causing the walls to get weaker. What you have during ovulation is the secondary oocyte being ejected out toward a fallopian tube. So this part right here is what you see going on right here. And then what is left over of the follicle will quickly break down and uh, become non-functional. Another thing I'll mention about this process here of ovulation. For a very long time, people thought that the process was very, uh, very abrupt, very violent, you know, like a cork coming out of a bottle of champagne, but it's actually not the case at all. The process of ovulation is fairly slow. It takes a good amount of time for that to happen. So it's not as sudden or it's not as violent as people once thought that it was. All right, now we'll go, we'll go over maternal structures of the female system. Uh, the first one we'll mention are the fallopian tubes. The structure has multiple names. It's also known as uh, the uterine tubes or the oviducts. All have referenced exactly the same structure. Now for this class, we will reference them as fallopian tubes. 
Now each tube will expand or near the ovary uh, in a funnel-like shape and that structure is called the infundibulum. And on the infundibulum you will find uh, finger-like extensions called fimbriae. And these are there to help sweep in the ovulated oocyte into the fallopian tube. And that's necessary because it's in the fallopian tube where fertilization occurs. All right, so here you have the vagina here, you have the cervix down here. All of this would be the uterus, right fallopian tube, left fallopian tube, then the ovaries. We'll focus in on here. So you can see this section of the image is exactly what's going on here. You can see the secondary oocyte being ejected out during ovulation. And these individual extensions, these little finger-like projections, the fimbriae, are there to help sweep it inside of the uh, fallopian tube here. And then this enlargement here, this upside-down funnel shape as the infundibulum. And the whole point is to get this inside here. So as it travels down, it will usually meet the sperm cell right about here. All right, next structure we'll discuss is the uterus. Uh, this is a, of course, as you can imagine, a muscular, very muscular organ. It has a pear shape to it. It is hollow, so it can have space for the uh, developing fetus. And it's there to uh, receive the embryo and then to sustain it as it uh, develops into a fetus. There are various uh, portions of the uterus, and they have different names. Uh, the upper two-thirds is known as the body. And there's another portion uh, within the body called the fundus. It's not mentioned here, but, but for our class, just know that the majority of it is called the body. And then the lower one-third of the uterus is the cervix. And the uterus will have three different layers to it. You have the endometrium, which is the innermost layer. The myometrium, which is the thick muscular layer. And the myo is always a reference to muscle. And then a parametrium, which is the outermost layer. The next structure we'll talk about is the vagina. Fibromuscular tube that will convey uterine secretions. Of course, receive the penis during intercourse and serves as the birth canal for the fetus you know, from the uterus uh, to the outside world. And the opening to the vagina, that vaginal orifice, is partially enclosed by a thin membrane called the hymen. All right, now we'll go on to some external accessory structures. The first one is the labia majora. These are the uh, rounded folds of the fat tissue, or adipose tissue, uh, and skin also. This will form a very rounded elevation uh, just over the symphysis pubis, the pelvis, and it's called the mons pubis. A related structure here is the labia minora. These are going to be flattened longitudinal folds uh, that are found between the labia majora. And this is a structure that will form uh, the hood of the clitoris. So terms like majora, minora, those are indicating size. So majora, uh, think of major or large, and minora, minor or smaller. Uh, the clitoris, uh, this is found in between the labia minora. This will correspond to the male penis very richly applied with uh, nerve fibers. And then we have the vestibule. The vestibule is the space that is found in between the labia minora. This will include the opening uh, to the urethra and the opening to the vagina. And in this area, you'll have mucus that is secreted whenever a woman is uh, sexually uh, stimulated to help lubricate the vagina for potential intercourse. All right, this image, we have the last several slides put together. One thing I'll mention on here, this slide has terms that are slightly different than what we had uh, in our notes. Like our notes had labia majora. Here it's listed as labum uh, magus or labum minus. It still references the same structure. Majora or magus or major all mean the same thing. Minus or minora all mean the same thing. So this larger structure here would be the labia majora. Then the rounded mass that they form here would be the mons pubis. That actually translates to mountain on the pubis. Then these thinner, flattened folds are the labia minora. And where they meet would be, you'd find the clitoris right there. So the labia minora form the uh, clitoral hood to help protect the clitoris. And below there, you have the opening to the vagina here, the opening to the urethra here. And then the vestibule is the space that spans that entire area. Right here, we have a table uh, very similar to what we saw with the male reproductive system. The listing of the female reproductive organs, whether they be you know, accessory or the, uh, the gonads, what their name is and what their main functions are. Again, if you'd like to make flashcards, this would be another good slide to go over. This one focuses just on uh, the female reproductive system. All right, the last part that we'll talk about for this chapter is the female reproductive cycle. Now, this is characterized by a regular uh, recurring uh, changes within the endometrium. 
and that will uh, culminate in the uh, menstrual bleeding or the menses. So the term menses is referring to the blood itself. Now when it begins and when it ends will vary from woman to woman. This will begin around age 13 or whenever a woman goes through puberty. So it could be sooner than that and maybe later than age 13, but approximately age 12 or 13. And this will continue into her 50s approximately. It could be sooner than that. It could be later than that. And the name for the first, the first reproductive cycle that a woman goes through is called the menarch. So after ovulation on day 14 of the cycle, uh, the hormone progesterone will cause the endometrium to become really, really thick. And it's doing that to provide a, a favorable environment for a developing embryo on the chance that she does get pregnant. Now, high levels of progesterone and estrogen will inhibit secretions of LH and FSH. And that's there to prevent another ovulation from occurring. You don't want to ovulate more than one secondary oocyte in one month. And like it was mentioned previously, after a follicle uh, goes through ovulation, whatever's left over will quickly break down, it will release a select number of hormones, and then become will become non-functional. Now, after this point, you'll have higher levels of progesterone and estrogen fall very abruptly, and then this dramatic decrease of progesterone in particular will cause blood vessels of the endometrium to constrict. Well, if you cut off a blood vessel flow, you're going to cut off oxygen being delivered to those tissues. So it's actually happening each month when a woman goes through a cycle, the blood vessels are constricting and starving it of oxygen. Well, that tissue will now start to die. So what you're getting each month with your uh, menstrual bleeding is the sloughing off of the endometrium lining of the uterus. So this will occur once a month from when a woman goes through puberty until middle age, approximately. At that point, the, the regular cycles will become very irregular. Instead of being once a month, it may go once every six weeks or once every two months. But then it gets to a point where the menstrual cycles will eventually stop. At this point, it's called menopause. And at this point, uh, the woman uh, cannot become pregnant at all. There's no secondary oocyte being ovulated out to become fertilized. So it is not possible to become pregnant after a woman goes through menopause. All right, on this uh, image, there are several things going on all at the same time. This top graphic here is referencing various hormone levels throughout the reproductive cycle. This second one here is referencing what's going on with the follicles throughout this time. Uh, this third part is showing the relative levels of estrogen and progesterone during this time. And this bottom one is showing the uh, relative thickness of the endometrium uh, throughout the cycle. So you can see here clearly a very, very prominent, very large spike uh, LH. That's going to occur around day 14, which is what causes ovulation to occur. Uh, you can see the increasing levels of progesterone here as a way to create a favorable environment for a developing embryo in case the woman does get pregnant. But after a few days, these, these levels will drop. And this drop is what will cause the, the blood flow to be restricted to the endometrium. And then the tissue will start to die and slough off. So the bleeding that a woman goes through each month for her cycle isn't marking the end of the cycle. It's actually marking the very beginning of the cycle. So the bleeding that you have is from day one to about day four or five. So it's not the end of the cycle. It happens at the start of the cycle. But this image has a good uh, summary of different aspects of the menstrual cycle each month. And the last uh, item we'll talk about for this chapter is a form of birth control known as tubal ligation. Now tubal ligation is the corresponding procedure in females to the vasectomy in males. So it is the same basic process. What you're doing is you are ligating or tying off the fallopian tube. That's why it's called tubal ligation. You're tying off the fallopian tube. And by doing so, you are preventing sperm cells from reaching the egg. If it can't reach it, it can't fertilize it. So here, left-hand side, we have the vasectomy in males. You can see the vas deferens that was uh, ligated, tied off from the other piece. So sperm cells can't get from here to here to be ejaculated out. So we have here is these uh, fallopian tubes, both this side and this side, uh, being ligated. And this can also be done in a temporary way or in a more permanent way by just basically tying off the ends of these uh, flopping tubes or you can cauterize each end but again it's like we talked about with uh, the male if this procedure is not done properly 
these ends can grow back together. It is possible for a woman to have a tubal ligation or her, her tubes tied and still become pregnant if it's not done properly. So again, the whole point here is you still have ovulation here. You still have the secondary oocyte going up here, but then it gets to this point where the fallopian tube is ligated and it, it, can't, it can't continue toward the uterus. The sperm cell that's entering here will get to that point and can't go any further. They can never physically meet each other to become fertilized. And even though these are corresponding procedures, there are some major, major differences in how these are carried out. For having a tubal ligation that requires a general surgery is a lot more invasive, it's a lot more expensive to deal with, it's a lot more dangerous, a lot more pain involved during recovery. But for the vasectomy, you can do this on an outpatient basis. This procedure only takes about 45 minutes or so. It's a lot safer, it's a lot faster, a lot less expensive, and the recovery time is a lot sooner. Even though these two procedures are comparable, how they're done, it's a lot more preferable for the male to have a vasectomy than it is to have the woman go through a tubal ligation. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter. Of course, like always, if you have any questions about the content here, please feel free to let me know. All right, so thank you for watching, and I will see you in our next video.